top chemical produced worldwide and their applications. Coming up next. Hey, what is up guys? Welcome once again to the channel. It's always great to have you back. And if you're new, don't forget to subscribe. Remember that in this channel, we talk about chemical and process engineering for both students and professionals that want to boost their career. And talking about careers, there's nothing more important for a chemical engineer than to know what are the substances or industries that produce the most amount of commodities. Remember that basic chemicals are required for all other applications in the chemical industry. Meaning that, most likely, you are going to encounter those chemicals eventually in your industry. Not only that guys, it also helps you to understand the chemical industry and understand future trends of the market. Also, it helps you to understand which industries depend on other type of industries and how the supply chain may be affected. I will definitely recommend you not only to memorize these type of chemicals, but also try to understand their categories, why are they so important, and also a little bit more on the process process conditions, raw materials, inlets, feedstock outputs, unit operations involved, and so on. Let's get started with the very top chemical produced worldwide, and it will be sulfuric acid. Probably you're wondering why sulfuric acid and why not other acid? I always get the question, why not hydrochloric acid or so? which is also in the list. But to be honest guys, sulfuric acid is a very powerful acid. It has two protons, which make it acidic, very convenient also for certain type of applications. If you want to decrease pH, it's available. But more importantly, sulfuric acid, it's used in the manufacturing of fertilizers. And as you can imagine, fertilizers are used extensively in crop production. It is produced under the contact process, which is one of the most important processes in the industry. Actually, I'm pretty sure that you may encounter a subunit of these in a large chemical complex. So the main idea of the process is to convert solid sulfur and oxygen from air into a more usable material, which is the sulfuric acid. This can be achieved via the contact process. So we have the solid sulfur and the air, which contains oxygen. And what we're going to be doing is essentially burning all this sulfur in order to convert it into sulfur dioxide. As you can imagine, this is pretty similar to burning carbon. So you have a solid carbon or coal, and then you combust it with oxygen from the air. You get sulfur dioxide and the oxygen as excess. What happens here is essentially the dust precipitator, removing all, all the particles that may have ended up there, then washing with water, and then spraying with the sulfuric acid. What happens here is essentially you're going to be removing uh, wastewater and you are going to end up with uh, sulfur dioxide and excess of oxygen. And from now on, we're going to be working with sulfur dioxide. And we want to further the oxidation or continue with the oxidation of the sulfur dioxide into sulfur trioxide. This happens at the catalytic converter or a reactor which uses a catalyst which is the vanadium pentoxide, B2O5. What the catalyst is going to do is convert the sulfur dioxide into the sulfur trioxide. What we're going to be doing in this unit is adding much more sulfuric acid to the sulfur trioxide in order to form the so-called oleum. Oleum is nothing more than the sulfuric acid. And later on, you can separate that into sulfuric acid. And that was how the contact process works. The second chemical produced worldwide will be nitrogen gas and oxygen gas. And yes, I know that probably you're wondering why these gases are used extensively. But first, things first. These gases come from, yes, you already know it, from the air. There's a lot of nitrogen, actually almost 80%, and there's about 20-21% of oxygen. Probably you are now asking yourself, why will we want the nitrogen? And actually, nitrogen is one of the best materials or precursors for ammonia. Remember the Haber process, which we are going to explain in short, has one of the best output for ammonia. And ammonia is then transformed into other very important fertilizers, hence the importance of nitrogen. And now going back to oxygen, well, oxygen gas, probably you have met some applications already, but the most common application of oxygen is as a reactant for other oxidation reactions, as well as oxygen 
or oxidant material for other fuels. Nitrogen gas and oxygen gas come from the cryogenic separation or distillation of air. Essentially what happens is we have a distillation column and we're going to separate nitrogen gas, oxygen gas, and other materials such as xenon, argon, and so on. Now it's time for some petrochemicals. I'm pretty sure that you were expecting those. And we're talking about ethylene and propylene the two carbon and three carbon alkanes that you encounter in crude oil and natural gas. The majority of production of ethylene and propylene are essentially via the steam cracking process. The steam cracking process, as the name implies, is a mild cracking via use of steam. You will start with naphtha and mildly crack it into substances which are known into the C2 group, which is ethane and ethylene, then the C3 carbons, which is propane and propylenes, then C4, C5, and sometimes aromatics, as well as C6 group. The important part right here is not only the steam cracking itself, but also the cold section, which is the separation of ethylene via distillation and propylene via another distillation column. Once that you separated those two materials, you are all set for the production of polyethylene and polypropylene. And by the way, guys, if you want to learn much more on petrochemicals, I have a playlist on my YouTube channel. It explains a lot of paraffins, olefins, what are petrochemicals, difference between petroleum refining and petrochemistry, all that. But if you really want to make a deeper dive, for sure check out this course, The Petrochemicals, A Complete Guide to Process and Industry. So let me give you just a very quick overview. We talk about naphtha and gas cracking, the process I was explaining you with further details, the hot section, the cold section, how we separate the C2, C3 groups, then we have the FCC and how we recover the cuts. Then we have basic gases. Actually, we talked about already nitrogen gas and we're going to be talking about ammonia. C1 group, two, three. So all the products that are produced from the ethylene or ethane per se. I will be leaving the playlist link as well as the course link in the description and also in the cards. Now let's continue with the chloroalkali industry or chloroalkali process. As the name implies, we're going to be producing chlorine and alkaline solutions, namely sodium hydroxide. The main idea from this process is to treat a brine, brine meaning salt and water, technically speaking, sodium chloride and water, and we will be producing chlorine gas, hydrogen gas, and a solution containing sodium hydroxide. As you can imagine, sodium hydroxide is one of the materials that is used extensively, especially because it is a very basic material, meaning that it has a very high pH. It is used in bleach, detergent, and also as a precursor of many reactions. In the other hand, we have chlorine, which is a gas that is used also as a reagent for other materials. Most commonly, VC, which is vinyl chloride, which eventually converts into PVC, polyvinyl chloride. Now it's time to talk about ethylene dichloride. So as you can imagine, we already talked about ethylene, we already talked about chlorine, now it's time to get them together. The product of this reaction is typically named as ethylene dichloride, which is by itself not that important, but the product that can be formed from this material is the monomer of PVC, namely vinyl chloride. We already mentioned the importance of sulfuric acid and we are going to be using it right now. The following material in the list is phosphoric acid. And as you can see, it's an acid as well. Actually, it's also a very strong acid because it has three protons, making it very convenient for our industrial applications. One being the production of, yes, more fertilizers. Actually, 80% of phosphoric acid will be sent for production of more fertilizers. The other 20% being as a acid or reagent for further chemical production. Hence, the importance of phosphoric acid. Now, let's talk a little bit on the process. We're going to be mixing phosphate rock, which is essentially the ore of this phosphate. We're going to be mixing water and we're going to be mixing sulfuric acid. You already know it, guys. So I really love how these chemicals relate between each other because as you can see these are very bulk or basic chemicals that eventually keep going and as you can see they start branching out. Talking of this I'm going to be talking about ammonia. Ammonia is actually very common to encounter in chemistry books. It's the NH3 
which is formed from nitrogen gas and hydrogen. Actually, we already talked about nitrogen, so you know that part. So I will encourage you guys to check out how hydrogen is produced industrially. But let's assume that we already have our nitrogen gas and our hydrogen gas. You already know it, it's the Haber process. So nitrogen gas is going to react with hydrogen gas in a very specific molar ratio and also at temperature, pressure and catalyst conditions. The end product will be ammonia. Ammonia applications are mostly between 80-85% into the production of fertilizers, namely ammonium nitrate, ammonium sulfate and sometimes even urea. The remaining will be used in the production of nitric acid and some explosives. Since we already talked about ethylene and we already talked about oxygen gas, it's time to present you ethylene oxide. As you can imagine, it's the oxidized state of the ethylene it contains one oxygen and two carbons and the respective hydrogens. Ethylene oxide will then be used in the production of ethylene glycol. And ethylene glycol will be then used in antifreeze and as a precursor of other reactions. And finally, just to add a little bit on the organic side, I want to present you the BTX, or properly, benzene, toluene, and helium. Benzene is mostly obtained via the catalytic reforming in the refinery or via the steam cracking process, which we already discussed. What we are going to obtain here is essentially benzene and toluene and sometimes hyaline. These materials are used as a solvent or precursors. For example, benzene can be reacted with ethylene, which we already covered, in order to form ethyl benzene. Afterwards, ethyl benzene can be converted to styrene, and styrene may end up as polystyrene, which is a very common polymer to encounter. Regarding toluene or hyaline, those are solvents that may or may not end up as polymers or as precursors of other organic materials. But for now, and BTX, I think this is good enough information. So this was the top list of chemicals produced worldwide. It will definitely vary on your country if you compare it to the USA or to certain European countries or maybe African countries or Latin America or Asia. But nonetheless, these are the most important chemicals. Actually, I will say those are the backbone of the chemical industry. As you saw, we talked about fertilizers, agrochemicals, we talked about automobile materials, we talked about plastics, polymers, and much more. And I really want to encourage you guys to keep and track all the materials. For instance, after polystyrene, what are the applications of polystyrene? We talked about nitrogen, then ammonia, then ammonium sulfate. What is ammonium sulfate? Why do we need it for fertilizers? What type of food are we eating that require that type of fertilizer? Talking about phosphoric acid, I think it's kind of funny to know that phosphoric acid is present in your favorite cola soda. And why not? Go and check out for your detergent or soap and verify what are the active materials. I'm pretty sure that most of them came from these backbone of chemicals. Anyways guys, I hope that you enjoyed the video as I did making. It really helped me to refresh all the processes, products and routes of chemical products. And it also helps me to remember why chemical production is important in the first place. Nonetheless, I'm pretty sure that I may have missed some important chemicals. Let me know what is the chemical product that is produced the most in your country or region. I'm looking forward to compare what are the differences between the chemicals that are being produced here and in your region, and especially what are the chemicals produced on the market demands. Please don't forget to add your comment. And that's everything on my behalf, guys. I'll see you in the next video. Thank you.